All right. You're just going to stay there. I'll start over there. Right? Okay. Our sound is on. Hello. Okay. Ready to go. Good to go. So I talked today, and I'm going to apologize for my voice. You can hear it kind of squeaking. <clears throat> I'm going to let Lisa probably do most of the talking, um, but I'll try. So kind of bear with me. But our talk today is on myths. So when we think about what a myth is, you know, is it kind of a fiction? Is it a half-truth? It's things legends have been um, born of. So we have a lot of myths out there about Agile, about Agile testing. So, um, like our werewolves? So, um, we're so, we have so many mythical creatures that there are now so many movies. How many movies and TV shows are there now about vampires, for example? I would not be surprised if, especially a lot of young kids growing up, think those are real. Same thing with werewolves. We've had so much fiction about them. They've been ingrained in our culture. Uh, and I think the same thing is, we think for the same thing may be happening with the software industry around things like agile testing. There are things that people have said so many times that now they've started to believe them as true. Um, you know, just for an example that, oh, agile teams can always go faster or cheaper or better than traditional developers, uh, you know. Yeah, so. Um, so there, uh, the, the, there are also a lot of myths about Canadians. Janet yeah. is from Canada. So there's a ton of myths. I think it was Matt that sent me a link a long time ago. And, and it's funny, when I go down into the U.S., um, you hear a lot of things. Things like, it snows all year round. Well, it doesn't really. We do have summer. We might get snow in every month but not constantly. So there's a lot of myths that happen about everyday life. Okay. Yeah. So uh, Medusa is a, a mythological creature. She's actually a Gorgon. And uh, she made some other god unhappy. So that... Um, she had a curse put on her that everybody that she looked at turned to stone. She had all these snakes coming out of her head. She was a pretty scary creature. And um, so, as I said, gazing directly on her would turn onlookers to stone. So now that you're all stoned, we just kids. legalized marijuana in Colorado, yeah, by yeah. the way. <laughs> As you can tell, we're going to have a little bit of fun with this, <laughs> we hope. So have some fun with us. Okay. So these are the myths we're going to talk about today. I guess we could yeah, we can take, take these, these off, off now. now. We don't want you distracted. Though they're very beautiful. <laughs> um, and, and we like to bust some of these myths you've heard about agile testing. So some of the things that you might hear in the tester verse. Uh, testing is dead. Who's heard that lately at different keynote speeches and articles? Um, acceptance test driven development, specification by example. These are only things that provide checks that confirm behavior. That's what they're limited to. Um, testers must be able to write code, production code. That How many have that heard that? Yeah. Agile teams, it's all about the tools. Well, we are kind of obsessed by tools. I had to confess that one. Part of that one. That one might be like those half truths that develop in the myths. But it's not only that we're dazzled by tools. We actually may be using those tools for something. And um, the other thing is not confined to testing, of course. But a lot of people believe that when they implement Agile, they will go faster. Agile equals speed. Yeah, so those are the five we're going to talk about. Now, the first one, right? Testing is dead. Um, last year, um, James Whitaker did a keynote at, at Star East in Orlando. And he was very firmly said, let's leave testing to the business users. 
We don't need testers, right? It caused a great uproar in the whole conference. That's what everybody talked about for the whole week. And you're kind of going, ah, you know, not good. So we're going to run a little video now. He looks a little worried about it, but. <laughs> but a lot of you recognize this clip, right? If you've seen the old Frankenstein movies. You know, the myth. It's a myth of testers well, being dead. It's not a myth that we're alive, though. No, it's not a myth that we're well, alive. We it's a myth that we're dead. <laughs> so when we think about that, um, one of the things that occurred to me when we were doing, when I was listening to James talk about that, and I've heard other people say it, is that he neglected to talk about his context. I know that every one of you guys, unless you're working on the same team, are in a different environment, right? So when James, was, James Whitaker was talking about testing his dad, he worked for Google, right? So when I'm holding my Google Maps, on my, you know, my phone, is it critical? Can I let the business users and the users test it? Absolutely. But if we start taking into our context and start thinking about our environments, if you're in mission critical like life support, right, you're not going to let your users do it. If you're in banking, I, I shudder to think that I'm going to use my banking, my online banking, and they haven't been tested. So we really have to consider our environments that we're in, right? Um, in this year's, in this month's, in November, December's months of <clears throat> better software, Lee Copeland wrote an article, and it was called, what is it called? Um, I forget, I don't even have it on there. I don't have the name in there. Um, but it was on that very topic. And he's he made the point that I've been talking about since I first heard that. But testing is not dead. Really understand your environment. Understand what you need for you. My biggest worry is that some, I don't know, management person, some VP is going to hear him talk and going to go back to their organization and go, we don't need testers anymore. Yeah, we can save a lot of money. Just get rid of all the yeah, stinking testers. Yeah, we don't need it. And that's probably my biggest worry. So I think part of what we want to do is make sure that we destroy these myths and talk about it. Um, Lee did a good thing on writing an article on it. Yeah, um, and I went to the session that Tom Roden and Mike Scott did this morning, and it was a perfect example of where you have to understand the business domain and get the business domain people involved, but you also have to translate those things into, for example, automated tests to keep up with the release, the frequent releases. And so we need that critical knowledge. So the reports of our death have been greatly exaggerated, I think, as they Mark have. Twain said. All right. Next myth. Oh. So acceptance test-driven development, specification by examples, writing all these tests in advance of coding so that we can verify that the right code was written. Uh, some people see that only as a, as a checking process. And of course, checking is important. We need automated regression tests to free ourselves up for other tasks and also to make sure that we don't release any regression bugs into production. So that's de definitely important. But they do more than confirm behavior. Saying that they only do one Just, thing is like saying Thor, the god of thunder here, you know, that all he had at his disposal was that hammer. Thor had other tools. He could do other things than whack people with a hammer, which, by the way, would come back to him like a boomerang when he used it on somebody. That's pretty yeah. cool. <laughs> so there's a related story to that, and, and Lisa kind of touched on it, um, that testing is only for software. So Michael Bolton, <clears throat> who introduced the idea of checking and testing, checking to confirm behavior, testing to use our critical mindsets, you know, our thinking skills. I think he stopped short a little bit. I believe 
that those same skills we can apply a little bit more, right? We can apply them to ideas, testing our customers' expectations, their assumptions. Yeah, and, and so eliciting examples from customers is an excellent way um, to yeah. understand what's the purpose of the business problem they're solving. If we don't have the business domain knowledge that we need, we may allow them to just say, here, implement this for me without asking them why. What exactly, what problem are you solving with this new feature? It may be, if we understand the feature well, that we can help them find a better and maybe less expensive solution. So we need to have testers with these skills. Um, so it's, we have to focus, I think somebody said this morning, we should be focusing on the value that we deliver, right? Not only that the software works in some technical yeah, sense. The solution. And, um, and we have to be able to extract that value, the definition of that value from the customer. That's a, that's a skill that agile testers have and need and have. Um, and, and again, we don't want to stop with delivery. I mean, my mindset always was, you know, hey, we've kicked that software out to production. Now we're just going to work on the next feature and we'd forget about what was out in production. But we really need to use the feedback from customers of, did they find this feature valuable? How did they use it? Was it worth developing in the first place? So we need to use all that information to feedback into our future development and testing. Yeah. And we, I mean, we test so many things. Um, as you go around, you test, I don't know, the food when you were eating it. Didn't like it, you didn't eat the rest. Um, so we want to carry that forward and really think about testing in a whole different manner, right? The collaboration of the team. All right, so let's move on to the next myth. See our unicorn. Not just a unicorn, also Pegasus. It's a, it's a mixture. How unique is that? <clears throat> but truly, you know, this is one of the biggest myths out there right now. Um, testers must write code. Elizabeth Hendrickson did a, a survey uh, last year, and she updates mm -hmm. it every year, I believe, on testobsessed.com. And if you go looking at it, um, she's showing that more and more companies are advertising that their testers must write code, right? Is that true? Is it your truth? Is it your reality? Um, and I think, you know, the, the pendulum swings one way to the other. Big independent test teams that come solely from, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> from the business to are we going to fill them all with programmers, right? And I'd like to point out that Pegasus, so this is partly Pegasus, partly Unicorn, Pegasus sprang from Medusa's dead body. So how's that for a coincidence? Um, That's a, a little tidbit of it. You didn't know how many knew that. <laughs> but I think part of this testers must code mentality came from companies like uh, Microsoft, where the, the testers at Microsoft are actually programmers that are hired for their programming skills. And, you know, they've, they've been much vaunted for having two testers for every one developer. Well, they're certainly testing a, an aspect of that software, right? But they're not necessarily testing the whole picture. There's a lot more to testing than that type of testing. And we have to keep that in mind. It's sad to me that so many teams don't value skills like exploratory testing or ability to collaborate well with the business people. And I exactly. think that partly comes from the birth of... Agile and extreme programming being it came from developers. It was developers who came up with those practices and, and that language around it. And at the beginning, they thought that the customers could define all the tests and they would automate the tests and, and really they didn't need those testers. Uh, and I think that we've evolved from that point of view, but we still have groups of developers. I know the developers I've worked with over the years, they just feel more comfortable working with somebody who speaks their language who can sit down in an IDE and write code and debug and, and somebody that they can use terminology to that they know they'll be understood. They don't necessarily want to work to have to communicate with us. And so I've had problems myself getting my own team to say, hey, this candidate, we should interview her because she's an excellent 
exploratory tester. She's really got some good skills. Or she's got some great business analysis skills. She works really well with customers. She knows the right questions to ask. And, you know, it's just out of their comfort zone. I think that's led to a lot of this viewpoint. Mm -hmm. I believe so, too. So if we look at the reality, we want people on our team to have mixed skills, right? On an agile team, you know, those roles are all blurred a little bit. I mean, I, I was um, a developer years ago, but I wouldn't ask me to code anymore. I don't think it would be a good thing for a company. I think it'd be kind of scary. Um, but this, the T-shaped uh, skills, a, a lot of people have seen this. <clears throat> it's out there. But if we look at people, we have, um, you know, the breadth, the multi-discipline skills. So maybe I... I'm not a programmer, but my, my depth is in testing. That's my passion. That's where I really want to be. So that's the skills that I'm going to um, really try to develop and get better at. That breadth. I want to have a little bit of business analysis skills. I want to have a little bit of a programming skills or something. Maybe not programming, but I want to have a variety of skills but it won't be the depth. The other way goes for programmers, right? Mm -hmm. They like programming. That's their strength. It takes a lot of work to maintain those skills. In fact, I was talking to a programmer just last week and he goes, he said, you know what? I'm actually going out of programming. And this is one of my favorite programmers. I was kind of sad to <laughs> hear it. And he said, I think I'm actually going to go into, I think my, I'd rather be in um, the, the uh, lead kind of position, a team lead, uh, agile coach. He wants to go more into that direction. He said, it was too hard to keep up with all the technical skills. So if we're asking programmers to not only keep up their technical skills and programming, oh, by the way, you have to do all the testing and keep all of that, something is going to suffer. And I really believe that the depth is what's going to suffer. Um, I heard somebody say this morning, and I, I forget, I apologize. I know you're in the room. That um, they had asked a programmer about something about patterns. And those young programmers didn't know about patterns. Are we going to lose a lot of that if we expect everybody to be able to do everything? So I know Lisa and I both believe in, in the T-shaped skills, having a breadth but depth. Yeah, and it can come with a lot of other directions. Um, I know a lot of testers, some of the best testers I know came from, um, they were technical writers or they did mm -hmm. customer support or they were some kind of, they had a lot of subject matter expertise. Did anybody in here come to testing from that direction? Yeah, so a few of you. So yeah. there are all kinds of different skills that make us valuable and we need all those skills on the team. We do. So, you know, what's the solution, right? Well, technical awareness for testers. Um, if we look at it, do I need to know how to program? Well, it might help. But can I read code and maybe offer suggestions? Can I listen to a conversation to a developer and actually talk to them about um, architecture a little bit. Do I understand those things? So these pictures, that top one is the Marina Bay Sands in, in Singapore, right? Um, and that's, you know, some pretty heavy-duty architecture to build that. So your context, your environment, might require to you to use a whole lot of different technical skills than somebody who has a very simple three-layered architecture and is doing a website. Maybe the skills you need is completely different. So you have to understand those kinds of things. Now, technical awareness is, it was actually the first time I heard this, um, it was a lady in my hometown, Calgary, um, Lynn McKee, and I went, ah, that is just the most awesome totally great uh, phrase to say what testers need on agile teams. You need to be able to talk. Um, 
It doesn't mean I need to be able to program, but I'm going to collaborate, and I'll let you take over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we already have programmers on our teams. If we didn't have programmers, we wouldn't have any software product. And so given that we already have those skills on our team, why do we need testers who have more of those skills? Also, I, Janet and I both have a programming background, but guess what? We don't do that all day, every day, like the production programmers on our team, the people writing the production code. So it doesn't make sense to hire more people with exactly the same skill. It makes sense to hire people with the T-shaped skills, but who can communicate and collaborate well with those, with those programmers, which is more of a trick than you'd think. A lot of people from traditional testing backgrounds who've never worked with programmers before are not going to feel comfortable with that. And so if you're a test manager, or you need to help, or a, a development manager, you need to help support people in making that transition and acquiring, those, acquiring that technical awareness. So hopefully you're only hiring people who love to learn, and so they can learn those skills. Right. Okay. But it goes the other way, right? Right. So programmers really ought to make an effort as well to get some testing awareness. And by collaborating with us, we can, we can help them. We can transfer our testing skills to them at the same time that they're tr transferring some of their technical knowledge to us. So we can all be one big happy team. That's one of my favorite whole teams right there. Um, and it, there's just so many. There are so many more technical things we need to know. Um, well, this is more, relates more to the that last slide. It's okay. Sorry, I forgot to say it. But I'm reading a draft of a, a new book coming out by John Hagar on doing attack testing on embedded software and mobile devices. And he points out how much in the last few years these mobile devices have exploded and the amount of embedded software that there is in the world has just grown exponentially. And so we better start learning some of the skills we need to test those kind of things. So there's always something new to learn. And the programmers should learn from the testers as well as vice versa. Yeah, so, so uh, for example, if you want your programmers to learn a little bit more about testing, I'm gonna recommend a, a, a book that I'm halfway through, and it's not out in publication, though I think you can get it in beta. Um, Elizabeth Hendrickson is writing a book called Explore It. Nice and easy to read, but it would give your programmers a whole new understanding of what kinds of things you might want to test. Obviously, it's about exploratory testing. But all of a sudden, it opens up the world to them because there's a lot of things you don't think about, right? And, and only through true co collaboration, like automation. That's right. a good example. Yeah. I'll let you. Well, and um, another, in addition to Elizabeth's book, we're just seeing more talk about developers getting involved in exploratory testing. And Siggy Bergeson, where's Siggy? He has, he has a session this afternoon on that very topic. So I would highly recommend that you go see how he's able to involve, he's the only tester with a whole bunch of developers, mm -hmm. but he's able to get them involved not only in test automation, but in exploratory testing. Right. All right. So next myth. Agile yeah. teams are dazzled by tools. Fairy dust. Magic. It's magic. <laughs> all we need is just the right tool, and we'll solve all our problems, right? Uh, we'd all like to think that, I think. Um, but um, it's, a great, it's great that today we have so many tools to choose from. We have open source tools. We have vendors creating more and better tools. And so there is a temptation to just find the coolest tool that you can uh, rather than start you know, by thinking of the problem you're solving. And so a lot of Agile teams are accused of just playing with tools and not really accomplishing anything with them. I actually heard somebody tell me um, last week they were talking and they said there was, they had four different teams and this was a problem in their company. They had four different teams all working on the same product. <clears throat> Each team had chosen their own tools. The problem was coming and they could see it was one they obviously hadn't anticipated, um, was when they put it out to production and their production support team has to support it, how are they going to marry all of those tools and all of the automated tests? It's those kinds of stories that kind of scare me, um, but also cause this myth to happen. Because if we get dazzled by tools, we're going to end up with a lot of those problems. 
So we should definitely use tools because without them, we can't possibly, in the time that we have, do the depth of testing and the breadth of testing that we need to do. So we do need to use tools. Um, and for example, um, my team has a, we, we have, I'm, I test an API that's used not only by our product, but by external customers as well. And so there are all kinds of different scenarios that could come through that API. And we don't know what the external customers might, we know how we use it. Somebody might have tried to use it differently. There's so many different scenarios that could go through this. If I had to manually test each one of these with a curl command, it would take me, you know, I wouldn't get to them all. I, I'd just give up or shoot myself before I got to them all. But so we have a, an, a console to help us test the tool that pre-populates a lot of the request headers and so on so that, and, and shows us a response. It's just that doesn't actually automate the test. It just makes it easier for us to do the test and evaluate the results. Uh, when I was on a team using fitness, we, I was able to crank a bunch of inputs through a fitness test. Yeah. I wouldn't necessarily save all those tests as regression tests, but I could explore much faster by putting inputs through the fitness test and evaluating them based on expected outputs, as opposed to trying to test every possible scenario through the UI. Still wanted to do a lot of testing through the UI, but this allowed me to cover a lot more test cases. Um, and you know, saving manual keystrokes is always good if you can do it. Yeah. Right. Death by paper cuts. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And, um, it's amazing because I got them no, uh, a few years ago, so I think um, Lisa is already the fourth time here, and uh, Janet the third time. So I'm happy, and I hope to keep them for the next year. I have to talk to them later on. <laughs> Let's see that. And um, as you know, there is, or there are a lot of people talking about gel testing, and there is few people that really um, do that and really um, influence the market. And, and I think that uh, Janet and uh, Lisa do that, did that, and they uh, did uh, wrote uh, or did write uh, a book about that. I think the book on agile testing, and I am um, happy about that. And I'm really curious about your talk today. Uh, I don't know if we are going to see some donkeys today too. I don't know. Let's see. Okay. Thank you very much. Enjoy the audience. Okay. All right. You're just going to stand there. I'll start over there. Collaboration is what's important. So we want to choose the right tools that allow us to collaborate. Because I truly think that's where the, the magic happens. That's how you manage to, to keep up and get that whole team working together versus us versus them or coding then testing. Right. You get coding and testing happening at the same time. And so yeah, one process. Mike Scott said in his presentation this morning that when he and Tom were using fitness for developing their test automation frameworks, some people kept saying, but then you have to have both testers and programmers involved in automating the test. And he's like, and, and that's a bad thing. Uh, if you yeah. asked anybody on the team I was on for the last eight years, why did we choose, or what was our greatest benefit from using fitness? It, it was the collaboration. It wasn't the regression testing. It wasn't anything else, but it made us sit together and talk. <laughs> exactly, and that's what you want. They should be, you know, promoting collaboration, right? And there are other tools that promote that type of collaboration. That's just one example. There should be a reason. So when we look at tools, hmm? not just unicorns, but donkeys as well. See, we got our donkey picture. <laughs> Had to put a donkey in there somewhere, right, Lisa? So I'm going to let you talk. OK. So this first picture is trying to illustrate that teams should choose tools by consensus, what works for everybody on the team. Now, it can be carried to an extreme, like the example Janet gave with four different teams using completely different tool sets on the same application. So that gets a little crazy. But we need to be able to experiment, uh, try out different tools, compare them, and find the ones that work best for us. And that gets the buy-in of really using those tools for the good of the team. But at the same time, it's, you know, it's a tool, not a rule. The tool should serve us. And so Janet put in this nice picture of my donkeys to show, or just one of my donkeys, to show yeah, um, 
that donkeys are an example of an animal that has served mankind for a long time. They're work animals. They actually do love to work. My donkeys are happiest when they're hitched up to something, pulling a heavy load. I don't know why. Uh, So they serve us. Now, I have to kind of differ with that a little bit because I do feel like the donkey concierge. I'm always out there doing things for the donkeys, it seems like. But... um, but they, that they do work for us. So that's, our tools should work for us. We should respect those tools. We should, we should use them properly and not abuse them and use them for the purposes that they're intended for to solve our problems. So when we're doing that collaboration and choosing the tools, <clears throat> and when Lisa says the team, I mean, the team is usually our product team, our project team, our delivery team. But remember that there's an extended family. It might be other teams that we have to coordinate with as well. Right. And so we have to think about that. Or even our customers. So Absolutely. if external customers are using your API, for example, you want to be able to provide them with tests or documentation, things that they can use yeah. to learn how to use, use it properly. Okay. Next myth. The fifth one. Agile. It's so fast. We a, and we've got a dragon in there for me. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> Dragons in all slides, as well as unicorns. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, uh, agile is kind of the next new thing. Well, maybe now Lean Kanban is the next big thing. But something agile is is still the popular thing. So a lot of companies say, yeah, we're having trouble with our software development. It's too slow. We're missing deadlines. That agile thing, ooh, they have sprints. We'll go really fast. So there's a big perception that people have that Agile implies we're all going to go faster. Uh, faster, so, you bigger. Know, let's you know. move up those deadlines because exactly. we can go really fast now that we're sprinting. So, you know, this is not only an Agile testing myth that's very damaging, but it also makes managers say, okay, well, we're doing Agile now and nothing's faster. And why are these testers being such a bottleneck still? You know, I don't understand Please. this. This was all supposed to go away. Okay. So reality, new teams go slower. Yeah, it's ha- has anybody in this room actually had the experience of this week we unemployed Agile and we immediately went faster? Yeah, nobody's done that. Yeah, Agile actually slows you down a lot. And I try to warn people like about the this. It's a huge investment in time to understand Agile values and principles and how to apply them to learn all the practices that most Agile teams choose to use, like test-driven development, refactoring, test automation. Of course, those things aren't necessarily confined to Agile teams, but they generally seem to go along with Agile. And they need a lot of time to learn and experiment and find ways to improve their process. And if they don't have this ability to learn and have time to invest in it, they're going to just keep incurring more and more technical debt. The code's going to not be protected by automated tests. They're going to take shortcuts in their design to where pretty soon nobody even understands the code, so they can't even change the code. So if you don't make that investment in time, you're actually going to go slower. So you have to focus on quality. The, The other thing that you go slower is just learning to work with each other in a different way. Learning to collaborate. Right. Because it's always been handoffs or something else. All of a sudden, we're asking those same people that have been maybe adversarial, to be best friends and collaborate. It takes time, so you shouldn't expect it overnight. All right. Reality. Well, we kind of talked about that at the same time. Yeah, so we need time to learn, experiment. Um, The whole idea of moving testing to the front of coding and having it as an integral part of the coding process is how it should be, but it takes time to learn how to do that. Um, Have you ever watched? I like to use children in a lot of my my presentations. Um, I have three grandchildren and I spend so much time just, I have time now to sit and play with them. And if you watch them, how they learn, they learn by trial and error. And we want to, as adults, we seem to want to just magically, I know how to do, I read a book. I can now do this. I know how to do ATDD, acceptance test driven development. It's magic. You have to experiment and play a little bit. Have some fun, right? 
And, then, and the learning is what brings innovations. Companies that allow their people time to learn and play with yes. pet projects and do something other than their day job, that's where they get the new innovations that make the company a lot of money. So it's, it's not only good for making the employees happy, but it's usually good for the bottom line of the company as well. Mm -hmm. Reality. We have to focus on quality. You said that in, in the first yeah. slide, right? Now, one of the things that is really hard for a lot of agile teams, and I believe testers can have a really um, good impact on that, is product owners want more features. Do we have any product owners in the room? None? Come on, yeah. I'm going to pick on product owners for a minute. I only got a couple of them. It's okay. I'm not too many Pro to offend. <laughs> product <laughs> owners <clears throat> or customers, anybody, they want more features. So they're always asking for more features. I was in, in Bali, and that's where this picture comes from with the, you know, these nice, beautiful, fast cars, <laughs> right? I sat there, and we were filling up with gas, and we're looking at them, and they're moving one step, maybe going two kilometers an hour. The max you can drive in Bali, if you've got a clear road, is maybe 30 kilometers an hour. Why would somebody, anybody, bring in cars to drive there? There is no infrastructure to support that. And you'd, so adding new features without understanding the trade-off, and I think that as testers, part of our responsibility is try to um, articulate some of those trade-offs and, and work with the team to understand what that is. Because if your infrastructure or your technical debt is too high, it doesn't matter how many features you put in because they're not going to do what you want it to. Yeah, and Agile, it wasn't intended to be about speed. It was intended to be about delivering value to the business frequently, adapting to the changing needs of business, at a sustainable pace. Exactly. That's Elizabeth Hendrickson's definition of agile. That sustainable pace embodies a lot of concepts like good design practices, refactoring, automating tests, pair programming, yep. all collaboration with the business, all kinds of practices that have to go into that so we can deliver value and make sure that that's what we're doing efficiently. And if we focus on speed, all we're going to do is keep incurring more technical debt. We have to focus on quality to get speed. The te a team I joined in 2003, we made this commitment to focus on quality. And yeah, the first year, we didn't deliver all that much to production every sprint. Maybe one or two small features. And the, develop the customers were actually happy because before that, they weren't getting anything. So a little bit was better than nothing. But then the second year, things started to pick up. We were able to automate all reg regression tests. We learned how to do test-driven development. We started to learn how to use examples to drive our development. And also, the team stayed together because we were very happy working together because we enjoyed having time to learn and learn how to collaborate and created a good culture and a good environment. And after a few years, there was nothing that we couldn't do. We, we were incredibly productive. We didn't focus on that. We didn't ever look to see, what's our velocity? We just kept doing the best work we could possibly do. And the company was, we actually got to go going so fast that sometimes at the beginning of a new iteration, the business people had no stories ready for us because we'd actually gone past what they had planned. So it can be done. So speed is a byproduct, right? It is not the goal. Okay. So we talked about five different myths, right? Testing is alive and well. Acceptance test-driven development. Specification by example. Behavioral-driven development, whatever you want to call it. And there's lots of names out there. It's one of the things we can't agree on is what we're going to call that thing. But acceptance test driven development has kind of gotten to be the, the norm and the things. But it's, it's one of those, it'd be really nice to come up with a single word. It is, but just the idea that testing doesn't, isn't coming at the end. It's coming at the very beginning yes. of somebody having a concept of a feature. And we're going to start helping elicit the purpose, the examples of how that feature could be used, the examples of misbehavior that we should watch out for. So this is a process that begins, we begin exploring right away as soon as somebody has an idea. Yeah, bring out those assumptions. Really think about 
that testing is beyond testing software. It's testing the solution. And part of that solution is, are we doing the right thing in the first place? Let's really prevent the defects. Um, personally, I'd rather spend time doing other things and not finding defects. And, and we do have to do some of that. We do have to do that exploratory testing. It is important. But if we're finding so many defects afterwards that could have been prevented, you know, it's a waste. It's a waste of my time. It's a waste of the developer's time. It's a waste of everybody's time, right? And the third myth. Yeah. yeah, testers must, testers don't need to know how to program. It's helpful if testers have a technical awareness of the general architecture of their system. They can, they can speak enough of the language of the developers, of the business people, of the other people on their cross-functional team to collaborate with them. But the important thing is the skills we bring to the party, not how well we master other, the skills of other roles. So that's something we should keep in mind. Learn. Yeah. And then, you know, tools. Okay, I'm just like the next person. I was looking at Mike and Tom's demo of their new framework in the new fitness this morning, and I have, my new team doesn't use fitness, that it's like, after I saw that, I really want to use it. But I've made the mistake so many times over the years of uh, going for the tool rather than first sitting back and thinking, what do we want our tests to look like? What works for us? And I actually learned that from reading Marcus's book. It's like, oh, that's where I've been going, going wrong all this time. But good, good teams that are successful in delivering software, they are first figuring out what they need a tool for and then finding the appropriate find tool for that purpose and using it properly. And it's so important. It really is. And then, yeah, if we focus on quality for long enough, we will achieve speed. But that's not what Agile is all about. It's about delivering business value frequently. And testers play an integral role in that. The, the art of testing is not dead. We're still honing our craft, developing our art, Absolutely. coming up with new ideas all the time, which I think you'll see at this conference. So we want you to think about, so last year's keynote, I started with this slide, and I thought it was a great ending to the slide as well, or to this presentation, because our reality, I mean, generations ago, that was their reality. A few people still live in castles, I guess, but most of the time, our reality has changed so much, right? Our reality is completely different than it was back in the day. So each and every one of you really think about are you listening to some of those myths? Or are you gonna be able to push back a little bit and say, hey guys, let's stop. Let's look at the truth. What is the reality? And, and what can I do to get us there? And I think that's kind of where we wanna stop. Yep. Um, we encourage you guys to email us if you have questions and thoughts, please do. That's our Twitter ID. Please tweet nice things. <laughs> and um, those were some of the references we talked about. Ah, that's what Lee's, <clears throat> Lee Oh, Copeland's. there's his article. Yeah. Yep. Oh, and he even used yeah. that, John, that uh, Mark Twain code. Exactly. Uh, so I'll just leave that up. We wanted to leave room for questions. And so hopefully somebody's have, here with a microphone. Yes. Yeah, see, he's all ready. And you're all ready? Okay. So oh, hopefully here there's we have some one questions. right here. So, thank you, ladies, for the presentation. Um, good that someone is knocking out the myth. Um, regarding your second myth about uh, the ATD. And uh, mm -hmm. you're saying that it br brings more value than checking, and uh, I'm a bit confused. I have so many okay. things to say about that, uh, but I'm gonna try <laughs> no, to good. make this short instead. Uh, I don't really get it. Uh, you are talking about that it's so important that testers are involved in this early instead of doing exploratory testing, but looking at the team, Usually you have five, six developers and one tester. You have more developers' time and the tester time. And 
all these practices, it's actually trying to figure out what the heck we're going to do. How are we going to solve this problem? Mm -hmm. And I don't really see why it's that important why a tester should drive this factor and, and be so take that as a responsibility. I think the value is within developers. They need to figure this out mm -hmm. and they need to understand it. I'm not saying that we shouldn't be part of it, but I don't f find the value why we should be pushing and driving it. We got other things to do. Because well, uh, no. we are the minority in a team. Yeah, that's, that's a valid point. I, and I don't think we're intending to say developers shouldn't also do these activities. Right. I think it's crucial for everybody on an, a team, a development team, to spend time to become well-versed in the business domain so that they can work with the customers themselves doing this. But the fact that testers are a minority on teams... That's another thing. It doesn't have to be that way. I know that that is the reality in a lot of teams, but maybe that's something we should work to change. The team that I was on for eight years had four developers and three testers, and even then, the developers had to do a lot of testing activities because testing took longer than coding. So, uh, so we, I, think, I think we need to ask the right questions. I, know, I think somebody with testing expertise that can see the big picture and understand the business domain needs to be there asking the right questions when we're creating these examples that will drive our coding. But whether that all has to be done by only testers, I agree. I, the reality is that somebody else is going to have to step up and help. Maybe you have business analysts on your team that can help with that. There are other roles that can jump in. Sometimes the product owners are able, to, are expert enough to do that for themselves. Um, so on my very first Agile team, I was one tester with 10 to 12 developers. So I was definitely in the minority. What I found was the greatest thing that I could do was sit in those iteration planning meetings, to sit in the release planning meetings, and ask the questions, because there were so many assumptions being made, that what I found was when it was, I had to do my exploratory testing and looking at it, that I wasn't finding the bugs that I was finding when I first started, it was worth my time <clears throat> to spend it asking the questions because then it allowed me to do actually more exploratory testing because I wasn't finding stupid bugs <laughs> and constantly going to the product owner and asking them, should it work like this? Because we'd, cut, we'd gotten a lot of it out in the beginning. So, you know, experiment to find out. And, and the other thing I wanted to say is, I'm sorry if we gave the impression that 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 was more important than checking. We just kind of glossed over the checking. Or exploratory testing. Obviously, it's those things the, are all you, vital. You need it all, right? The checking is our automation. And so we made, we made an assumption, and thank you for telling us, um, that automation is a given. And to me, that's our checking. If I can get the regression test automated, then that's what machines do really well, the checking. So, yeah, did that kind of... Address some of your concerns. Sure. We can Sorry. We can, we can talk later. <laughs> checking Mation. New word. Question over here. Question. Oh, Jose. Oh. Andre has a question here. It's, yeah. Uh, thank you for your speech. It was very interesting. And uh, I have a question about the third myth that testers must write code. There is another myth that developers should uh, can uh, test their code without testers. Uh, so someone calls this, uh, this people myth people a developer and test or a test engineer. How about this myth? Is it true or not? So there are like I know Microsoft is the one we yeah. use. They have that that software test and and they truly are writing code, but. I don't think that every tester has to be able to write code. So really understand what your team is doing. You know, um, is it necessary? What I find, and I've, I've seen a lot of different teams because I do a lot of consulting. Um, I see that um, teams that don't have testers, and there are teams that don't have testers, and they're delivering really good code all the time. Those applications tend to be more technical maybe delivering to another development team, or maybe a message handling kind of system, but something like that. It tends to fall apart 
when you start getting a lot of business um, logic because it's really hard to understand the whole system. So having testers who do that, um, and if you've got those people, then do they need to necessarily know how to code? Not necessarily. I'm going to be able to talk to my programmers and collaborate on the, our automation, and then we're going to get that shared common understanding. So it really depends on, on your application. And I think that is one of the things to really understand what works for you or you isn't going to work for them. And you really have to understand your own context. So yes, there are teams that have programmers and they're, that for testers, and, and it works really well. Thank you. OK. Did you have anything to add? No. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for the keynote. Uh, now that you busted these five myths, um, and uh, we all know that they're busted, right? So <laughs> what I want to know is, what are the myths that you didn't uh, cover in, in this keynote, and what other myths do you think we need to bust uh, after this? There's probably a bunch of them. Can you think of any offhand? Uh, not that. These, we, are, the, we, these we, are the we top ones that were in our minds. So. Yeah. We had a list of them, but I don't we remember. We had a mind map with others, but I don't remember on top. Does anybody, yeah. do you have some, Siggy, to suggest? No, I was just curious. If yeah. you, I, I was sure you had a couple well, We do, more but I don't know them offhand, because we were concentrating on these, trying to find Thank cool you. pictures. <laughs> unicorns, Pegasus, yeah. yeah. dragons. So uni <laughs> unicorns is going to be the theme of this uh, conference. Any other questions? Got another five minutes. One back there. Cecile. Hi. Um, I was wondering about tools. Um, I do agree with you that tools uh, are necessary, but I think they should be supportive only, because what I find is that a lot of uh, uh, teams uh, uh, use them as a substitute for communication. Uh, like, oh, uh, we are working on a trunk and we have uh, problems when uh, people are committing uh, at the end of the sprint and we get problems and then we can't deliver. Uh, and I think, uh, yes, you can use uh, a great uh, tool uh, uh, to work on that and, and to have your um, uh, uh, configuration management, etc. But um, in the end, it's all about if you communicate better and, for instance, uh, um, make an agreement on not to uh, commit riskful uh, uh, code at the end of the sprint, right. it's more effective and you get more out of it and it's yeah. cheaper. Common sense. So <laughs> really, if that is. But yeah, if we rely on our tools and never talk, that's not a good thing. And, and that's part of the myth is that a lot of teams rely on, on, on the uh, tools yeah. and forget about the collaboration, forget about asking the, what problem are we trying to solve? Yeah, right? and it, it's an excellent point. It, people think, oh, I bought a uh, project tracking tool and I work for a company, that's what we do. Uh, and so now every, all our problems are solved and we're going to be able to communicate well. And we were just talking in the Lean Coffee this morning, by the way, happening again at 7.30 tomorrow and Thursday. Um, yeah, about physical scrum task boards, yes. Kanban boards, where you can hold the cards and have a conversation right in front of that physical board versus the online tools, which, gosh, if you have a distributed team, as so many of us do now, how do you substitute for that kind of person-to-person -person communication? Video helps. There are lots of things that help. But I think you have to work extra hard nowadays on the communication. And I, thanks, Cecile, for making that point of we have to work really hard on the basics like communication. Does that blinking light mean we're out of time? Yeah, I, don't, yeah, I was just wondering that too. According to my watch, we got four more minutes. I don't know what that clock says. Hi there. Over the last 10 years, um, testing teams have been decimated by uh, offshoring. By what? Uh, offshoring. 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 Whether, oh, it's, yeah. you know, whether it's you know, Britain going to Poland, to, to India, to the USA, etc. And we're, you know, we've all seen jobs disappear. Um, with, with, with the onset of 
agile principles and practices supporting that, where do you see the practice of offshoring testing going? Do you think it's a dying art, or do you think with uh, the onset of collaboration face-to-face, -face, bringing down the barriers, we're seeing testing teams coming back onshore? Oh, I definitely, I don't, haven't heard a lot of success stories with offshore testing. And I've known some people who work pretty hard at it, sending people mm -hmm. to the offshore team to do training and making sure somebody has a stand up in the middle of the night, their time, so they can talk to the team in the other time zone. And I personally haven't heard a lot of success stories. Has anybody, maybe somebody else could speak to that. You have a success have story? One? Oh, wait, wait, wait for the microphone. Sorry. Actually, in our company, we practice different things, which is uh, test our product ourselves. But then, like twice a month, when we have big re releases, we ask external company to test our product on production. Right. Okay. So okay. we get also external feedback. And, and yeah. that's a, a good For point. For things like, yeah. uh, things like I, w I attended a talk by Julian Harty at, at OrDev a couple weeks ago, and he said in the mobile testing yeah. world, with mobile phones and devices, you really have to depend on crowdsourced testing. So I think there are some new domains where that's yeah. becoming more critical. I just don't have a lot of personal experience with it. Yeah, so I also think that as we're developing, if we're testing is a different thing than, than doing a, a beta test or a final acceptance test or something like that. Now, is offshoring gonna go away? There's always gonna be companies that are gonna do it because they think it is a lower cost. I don't believe it is a lower cost, and there's a few surveys out there now that show that, but they're still gonna do it because on the bottom line, they think it's a lower cost. So they're gonna try it until they realize that it's not, and then they'll bring it back. But there's gonna be companies that do it, so I, you know, hopefully. Yeah, and there, um, there may be situations is. that it's appropriate for and then it works, but yeah, in terms of working with your business people to try to come up with in an agile and, In yeah. an agile team, it's really, really hard to have um, testers in one place, developers in another. Yes, offshoring. <laughs> offshoring is cheaper. Yeah, no. So, thank okay. you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, it was a pleasure, always. Oh, thank you.